Good evening. My name is Bill Pearson. I'm the master here at New College. On behalf of the entire New College community, the New College Lectures Trustees, New College Board and staff, collegians residing here at New College and those at New College Postgraduate Village across the road, our 7,000 alumni and my beautiful wife, Ruth, may I begin by welcoming everyone who is here with us this evening. For those returning, welcome back. And those joining us for the first time this evening, a warm welcome. My welcome this evening will be considerably briefer um, this evening than it was on the first night, as I won't be repeating my welcome to distinguished guests and acknowledging the uh, long list of apologies I did on the first night. The recordings of the first two lectures are already available on our website and my full welcome is available there. Technology has served us well. I've received excellent feedback from afar. We have shared two thought-provoking lectures with extremely vigorous question times at the conclusion of each night. And our lecturer is nodding at me to affirm that statement. My sincere thanks to all those who've participated. I am describing Dr. Brown's lecturing style in terms of demanding trek. She drags us up to one pinnacle to observe the nurturing landscape and then dives down the other side to another mountain top to look from another. It's been exhausting, but it does illustrate the value of well-prepared lectures. Dr. Brown has been able to share the personal, the administrative, social policy, the clinical, the historical, and some research perspectives as, as we have traveled this vast landscape. She's also managed to sneak in some brief biblical glimpses into these subject areas as well. And she's managed to encapsulate these into what are very brief spaces of time. First, she discussed approaches for caring for individuals in times of crisis and stress with some appropriate self-reflection. Last night, she placed the individual in the context of their family and in this final night, she'll be looking at the context of, an, of the individual and community, especially church communities. This final lecture is of special significance to the new college communities. We have two colleges here at the University of New South Wales. New College, now in its 53rd year, with 247 undergraduate students, and has an impressive history of graduates first in their degree and a much, much greater who've gone on to be leaders in their fields. Across Anzac Parade is New College Postgraduate Village, which is home to 315 postgrad postgraduates and senior undergraduates. In its 13th year, it's produced 100 doctorates at the University of New South Wales. As I've said on previous nights, senior staff continue to innovate with the student leadership on how an entire community can best support and care for the individuals who live with us. This is challenging within large and diverse communities and I look forward to hearing and sharing Dr. Brown's insights this evening. Before we commence our time this evening, I wish to make three acknowledgements as I did the other night. The first is to close family members who've lost, lost relatives to, to COVID-19. There are several people in our colleges as well as people who've had to leave to care for grieving families. The second is to the Bedigal people, traditional custodians of this land. We pay our respects to their elders, both past and present, and extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are present with us here today. And I also acknowledge my fellow tr lecture trustees, Reverend, Right Reverend Do Dr. Michael Stead, Bishop South Sydney, and Professor David Cohen, President of the University of New South Wales Academic Board. Questions, as I've said before, we love questions at the New College Lectures. Attendees showered Dr. Brown with questions on the previous nights and I imagine we'll do so again this evening. So please just open your browser and type in sli.do as instructed, Slido, six letters, and type in our lecture, lecture tag, NCL2021, New College Lectures 2021, and you'll be at the question interface. So you can even be preparing these questions as the lectures are proceeding. Before we start, I am going to briefly pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we meet again here this evening, we thank you for the freedom we have in this country to discuss matters of life and love without fear. 
We ask for your blessing now upon our lecturer this evening, that you would grant to her clarity of thought and expression. Please grant to us all knowledge of you and a better understanding of you and your ways in this world. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Please don't forget to turn your mobile phone to silent and Dr Brown will now address us. Well, thank you very much, Adjunct Professor Pearson and the supportive audience here with me. But I especially want to acknowledge those of you who are online tonight who have made it to all three lectures. I'm congratulating all of us, myself included, for getting through to number three. It has been quite a marathon. And um, I have really enjoyed the privilege and the discipline of preparing for this series. Tonight, as you all know, we're talking about nurture in community, particularly looking at the Christian church, the family of faith. Let me give a brief introduction that, for those of you joining for the first time, have a sense of where we've come so far. There are some repeated themes, but here is my very brief little summary of the complex trek that we've been on over these previous nights. First, in looking at nurture of the individual in the midst of a mental health crisis, I looked at naturally nurturing contexts as opposed to relying too much on experts. In the second lecture last night, one particularly close to my heart, my interest in families and parenting, my big theme was how to turn back the tide of intensive parenting, starting with the tide historically in society that influences the family and ladens parents with a burden of inadequacy. And I particularly was concerned not to add to that sense of guilt and inadequacy for all the parents present last night. It's a complex situation, the anxiety around children. Well, here's where I'm traveling tonight. First of all, I'm returning to the mental health crisis. It's the overall topic of our lectures, nurture in a time of crisis, but I'm thinking about it in at the context of community. And in particular, is it reflected in our churches? Or other faith or purpose-driven communities, schools, service and community clubs? And some of this should also relate to workplaces. I'm asking these questions. Have churches, schools as well, have they become intimidated by mental health concerns amongst their members? Is there inadvertently a divide emerging between the well and the unwell? The unwell go out to experts and treatment and then come back as well people to enjoy the benefits of community. That's simplified, but I'll be unpacking that a bit more. I'll be asking, is there a loss of garnering the nurturing resources of the church body and their beliefs? I'm going to be reflecting on what does it look like to recover nurture in community, some positives coming to the end, and I'm going to divert to right at the very end to a personal journey of faith and nurture. So to start off with, let's return to some definitions of nurture. And I showed this slide the other night, I think it's a good one to return to, the biblical themes of nurture when you look up a dictionary of Bible themes. I think it's really interesting to reflect on the relational and the example basis of nurture that come through in the Bible. Instruction, care and example, caring attitudes and example, can you pick this up? The caring attitude of fellow believers, appropriate teaching, remembering that learning is part of the definition of nurture and by encouraging spiritual growth. 
every lecture I have declared my theoretical bias and showed a different aspect of Bowen family systems theory. So I will do the same tonight, but rather than a picture of Dr. Murray Bowen, psychiatrist and researcher, I have a picture of a community of highly sensitized meerkats. And I think this illustrates part of the journey I'm going on and opening up for you tonight to consider our relationship sensitivities in our communities and how they play out in patterns that can undermine nurturing. And Dr. Michael Kerr, who trained under Dr. Murray Bowen, has written about in a paper in 2009 how these sensitivities can be grouped into these categories of expectations, sensitivity to attention in a group, how much attention am I getting or not getting? Is it positive attention or negative attention? Sensitivity to approval and disapproval and sensitivity to distress in others, others that will evoke different responses. And where do these sensitivities emerge? Well, I think part of them is our biology, how we're created to be relational, social mammals with complex brains and very much needing relationships for survival. But clearly these sensitivities develop in our families of origin, whatever shape and history that looked like. And we take them into our communities, the sensitivities that we grew up with. I'm going to start with another clinical example before we move into more exploration and tell you the story of a person I'm calling Joe. Joe is a composite of many people that I've seen over the years who've come from ministry contexts feeling exhausted and burnt out. And when Joe came to see me, she was particularly responsible in her church community for overseeing pastoral care. She regularly felt used up by her efforts to care for people, particularly the growing number of fragile and vulnerable people in her church family who were exhibiting symptoms that would earn them diagnoses in the mental health sphere. Jo could acknowledge that she had a real pull to want to rescue and relieve distress and that neediness in others evoked that in her. She also acknowledged that she didn't just get caught up in the back and forth pattern of over-functioning and that the needy person really inviting to be cared for, it's a reciprocal process, any of these patterns. She also was caught up in using other members of the congregation and her leadership team to vent and talk about her worries and concerns for some of the fragile people in the congregation. She would often talk with ministry team members about this difficult person or this unwell person and the team would, they would pray for people but they would also label and she would label as well, narcissism, traumatized, various diagnoses. And there was a very strong pull to expand the counseling referral list for the ministry team to be able to deal with these challenging, fragile and needy people. Do you recognize Joe's situation? Some of you who are listening. I'm going to introduce now a chapter of a book that I've co-edited where one of our authors, Tara Stenhouse, who I hope might be listening tonight, she wrote a personal account that is very similar to a story of someone like Jo, of moving from feeling like she was constantly a rescuing pastor to a shift towards being side by side with people at the level of vulnerability that they were exhibiting. 
And I think I do commend this chapter to you, a personal account, drawing on biblical wisdom as well as family systems thinking about this pattern that can get in the way of developing a, a grace-filled, nurturing community. What Tara has written about is that she was automatically responding with an over-helpfulness that was activated outside of her awareness. And that the person that is used in this particular chapter's case example was part of the dance. As I said before, this is always, you cannot have an over-functioner or an over-responsible person who continues in a relationship pattern without a willing under-functioner or under-responsible person. We all, and most of us, have an experience in different relationships of either side of that posture. Turning now to mental well-being in the church. Is there any emotional or mental health benefit to being part of a community of faith or any kind of supportive community which has a purpose and a common goal? I assume that many of you have read research and heard lectures on the benefits of religious belief for mental health. There certainly is literature out there to affirm that. I've chosen one quote from a paper that came out in 2012 on the relationship between Christian religion and well-being. And this paper concluded that nurturing non-punitive religious community is associated with mental and physical health. Notice the two sides of it. And that active participation in church activities that enhance the member's social support system can be beneficial. It probably sounds quite obvious, doesn't it, that a sense of belonging promotes well-being, but I think it's very important to consider what is the basis of belonging that is fostered in our communities. This next slide shows from the National Church Life Survey how the sense of belonging is reported by members of congregation. This is an, an older survey, but I like the slide and I couldn't find a more recent one. It's back in the early 2000s. However, the data reported on well-being of church attendees has remained fairly consistent as I've looked at it. But I think this is quite an interesting and encouraging picture. I wonder what you think to see how many members of church congregations reported a very strong sense of belonging to their church. And I wonder what this means in terms of improved mental health. And as I was asking those questions and looking at the literature, it looks like, particularly from the, this same survey group, that in each year, approximately 17% of church members or, or attendees have sought professional help for mental health concerns. So about 17% of the entire population seeking help. That doesn't mean they're the only people struggling with mental health concerns. And when you look at the general population statistics, which tends to fall around 20%, I would say that I don't think we can read too much into it because it's a different kind of self-report survey than the expansive data on the general population. But it's interesting to consider. Is there a slight improvement? I'm not sure. Certainly, there are vulnerable, struggling people 
It may have been many of you at various times who are members of churches. And I do want to address, as was illustrated in the story of Joe, the growing concern and issue of burnout for ministry workers. And as another area of concern as we consider nurture in community. I wonder if you've heard anecdotally, as I have, that the impact of COVID lockdown and the pivoting required of ministry workers has been experienced by many as absolutely exhausting and many are running on empty, reporting that they are busier than ever. When I hear about anyone burning out and I notice my own seasons of feeling exhausted and burnt out, I'm always interested in the relational dynamics behind that. I think there are some clues to burnout in relationship contexts. But in considering the problem of ministry burnout, and there are certainly papers that talk about the increasing problem of it. There's a paper that I found very interesting, in, published in 2017 in the Journal of Psychology and Theology, that said that relational ministers exceeding typical social network sizes, typical social network sizes, were predicted to experience higher levels of burnout and lower levels of ministry effectiveness. I think this does highlight the question of complex relationship systems, how those sensitivities that I introduced at the beginning might get caught up, meeting expectations, attend, giving the attention that congregants are expecting, being aware of um, where the praise is, where the criticism is. I think it's a highly complex relational setting with, which has wonderful nurturing capacity, but like any relationship system, it can also impinge on nurturing. Considering ministry satisfaction and burnout, this is an interesting scatter plot that has been put out by the National Church Life Survey. It's a leader survey of ministers. And I think it gives a fascinating visual picture. What is a standout, and this is the problem of looking at mental illness, is you don't look enough at emotional robustness and satisfaction and strength. And I've tried to do that each night, is flip it and look at what are protective factors, who are thriving, even those who have been doing quite well and adapting in the lockdown and the effects of the pandemic. But I do think that this plot raises some interesting questions about the little dots, the number of dots that are moving across into the quadrant of happy but exhausted, the, the beginning signs of it being unsustainable, and then the, the little dots that are appearing in the quadrant of burnout with exhaustion and a loss of satisfaction in the role. I will also note that the literature on school principals, and there are other um, community leaders where you can find data on just about anything, but looking at serious data does tell you some interesting things. And the Australian Psychological Society does a health and wellbeing status of school principals report, comparing it to population norms. There are some very interesting um, facts that come through that and variations. It, what struck me is that there is over and above what you'd expect in the population as a whole, a high sense of satisfaction, purpose, and self-efficacy amongst principals, which is a protective factor. 
but there are very high markers of burnout as well sitting right alongside. So thinking now, what might enhance nurturing in community that could reduce burnout and that could be a place of calm, gracious belonging for the most fragile members of that community? I'm going to think for a moment, I'm taking a, this is my taking you on a trek and different vantage points, but I'm going to move away to an article that I found fascinating because it looked at the problem of medicalizing human struggles. And I think that relates to thinking about understanding nurture in church communities. It was published in The Lancet in 2018 titled Beware the Medicalization of Loneliness by McLennan et al. And the, the group of authors started by saying, loneliness was recently described in this journal as a public health problem that needs to be solved by the medical community. We believe that the medicalization of loneliness in this way is damaging. Uh, and I think about replacing loneliness with other categories of fragility and vulnerability. Here's, here's another quote from this very interesting paper. The medicalization of social issues has not worked in the past. Medicalization of loneliness will discourage the collaboration needed and medicine probably has no effective instruments with which to single-handedly address the absence of human connection. Isn't that a great thought? And while I've spoken over this series of lectures of the concern about over-medicalization, please don't misunderstand my position here. I see great value in having calm, appropriately trained professionals to assist, but not to over-medicalize so that it takes away from the base of nurture that is available in real life, family and community. I'm gonna turn now to the impact in churches of, of this medicalizing of mental health that as I presented in lecture one, has a long history to it. It hasn't just emerged. Um, the area of psychiatry, psychology, social work are quite new professions that have emerged and really flourished and burgeoned in the 20th century and into this century. But as I think about medicalization and church community, I have wondered about this separating of the well and the unwell and the categories and the diagnostic labels and their effect on nurture and community. And a 2020 paper on this topic put forward that matters of faith, including Christian faith, exist within some kind of bubble. Things within the bubble, spiritual and religious things, are primarily the concern of well people. If you are not well, then you need mental health professionals to help you get well so that you can go back to paying attention to whatever is in your bubble. It's just thought provoking to think about, are there bubbles where community is about people who are all doing well enough to be able to participate in the vision and the mission and the discipleship and the learning and growth? And is there a trend? This author thought there was, a British author and theologian and also psychiatrist. Uh, but I just wonder in church communities how quickly and inadvertently, not deliberately, people who are struggling with emotional difficulties are less welcomed in 
to the spiritual nurture that is part of being in a church family. Should we be surprised that there are so many struggling people in our churches? Those in ministry roles, do we expect more of them? Do we expect them to be robust all the time? And those in our congregations or communities, I wonder how you're answering the question. Uh, of course, we should expect it. There are many who are struggling in all of society and our churches and communities should be representing all the sectors of society. But as I ask this question, I'm reminded of a fascinating piece that really struck me quite some years ago when I read Tim Keller's book, best-selling book, The Reason for God, uh, the Reverend Dr. Tim, Tim Keller. And one of the criticisms of church and faith that he was addressing in this fine and thoughtful book was, what about all the character flaws of people who claim to be Christians who are in the church? And what Keller writes is, the church will be filled with immature and broken people who still have a long way to travel emotionally, morally, and spiritually. He goes on to say, good character is largely attributable to family and social environment, conditions for which we are not responsible. That's um, pages 53 to, to 4 for those that want to look it up. He does go on to say that what one should look for is where a person starts from in terms of their vulnerability, struggle and brokenness at the time they begin their Christian faith journey to see the growth that comes from that, but appreciating that everyone is starting from somewhere different. It's another theme that comes out of Bowen Family Systems Theory not exclusive to it, but it's this theme of a continuum rather than well and unwell or earning this particular label of um, mental illness. So I want to return to the notion of a continuum of vulnerability towards and then moving up the spectrum towards more maturity and resilience. And I want to invite you to hold in mind what I've just reflected on from Timothy Keller, that people are all at a different level in terms of their brokenness and what they've inherited from the families they've grown up in and the cultural context and the adversity that they face. There are many variations that mean it's not logical to put people into diagnostic categories of well or not. In this next slide, I highlight Bowen's hypothetical scale or continuum of differentiation of self, which take the jargon away, think of it as, as levels of emotional maturity in relationship. And I think it's very helpful to appreciate that not all humans we're in community with are at the same level and we cannot expect them to be able to all function at the ideal level of functioning in life. We're all coming from a different place. So just again, some food for thought on this. If It might be quite difficult to read such a detailed slide, but I'll just give you some examples at the lower end of the spectrum of emotional maturity, which is not a judgment. This comes with compassion and acceptance of what the hand of cards of the, of the generations that people have been dealt. But at the lower end, it's very hard to tell apart thinking and feeling. So you see the merging of uh, I feel and I think and I don't know the difference. So in this lower level, there is an immersion in a feeling world. People are so sensitive to others' opinions that it affects their functioning. There is a large 
response to relationships of either extreme compliance or the flip side of the same coin, coin of immaturity, which is rebellion. Moving up the continuum, just a couple of examples here. There's a little bit more separation of thinking and feeling so that they can both be a resource rather than completely clumped together. And in, at this level of the maturity con continuum, there is still a quickness to imitate others to gain acceptance. There is a lot of energy invested into loving and being loved. And there's little energy, therefore, left over for goal-directed activity. So a very strong togetherness push for being loved and accepted. And if energy goes into that, there's not a lot left over to have internal self-efficacy, set goals and follow them. Moving up the continuum, there's a greater awareness of the difference between thoughts and feelings. There's still a sensitivity to others' opinions. There's a hesitancy to say what one believes, lest they offend another. And I don't know about you, but I, I could tick all those boxes. So I can identify. I, I, Bowen proposed that the majority of the population are probably in that space. And then you move up to more maturity where there is less emotional reactivity, less chronic anxiety, able to choose between being close to people and when to focus on autonomous goals. And then at the highest end of maturity, which may be a, a hypothetical category. People can listen without reacting. They're able to assume responsibility for themselves and not preoccupied with placement in the hierarchy. I wanted to spend a little bit of time on that because we are all strugglers in our communities, sitting on a continuum of the highly vulnerable to the more moderately vulnerable. And all of this impacts the degree to which those relationship sensitivities play out in the way we do community together. Higher on the continuum and the maturity scale, individuality and togetherness operate more as a working team. They're both necessary, they're in balance, neither force dominates and flexibility prevails. Sounds attractive, doesn't it, to be part of that kind of a society? Uh, can you hear the, the signs of regression in our society when you look at that continuum list? What is this saying, particularly for leaders in community or in churches? It is ideal for leaders to be more mature, but it's not essential. I think the most important thing is for leaders and workers in faith communities, in Christian community or school communities, to be aware of their maturity gaps and responsibly dealing with them and observing them and not projecting their immaturity onto others, for people to become more aware and own their maturity gaps is, I think, a real gift to the communities that they're part of. And it can truly benefit the more vulnerable in a community, being able to stay in one's own boundaries more in relating side to side with others and for leaders in church communities to relate to the more mature side of the system. A lot of relationship energy gets directed to where the immaturity is because it evokes more distress and reactivity and judgment and labeling. So can leaders think about how to relate to where these more non-anxious, less reactive groups of people are, not to exclude the vulnerable, but by relating to where maturity is, it helps the vulnerable benefit from a community of people who are less reactive and more responsible for themselves. 
I'm going to detour now to thinking a little bit about a biblical lens and how this comes into considering relationship sensitivities. I wonder if you've ever heard of this book. It's one that was talked about a good deal in a few decades ago. It was published in 1975 by a very well-known, respected psychiatrist from a Jewish background, Dr. Carl Menninger, one of the Menninger brothers who started the well-respected Menninger Clinic, of which Bowen was part of for a time. And Carl Menninger has written this book, Whatever Became of Sin, not a popular word these days. And he decried in his writing the way that society in the 70s had moved away from calling sin, sin. Collective and individual moral failings was what he was talking about. His book is not a religious text at all, but he does document how many things which would once have been called sin in an earlier time at different generations are now called a symptom, a sickness, and he writes about the importance of considering moral values as an essential aspect of psychiatry. Not a discourse I have heard in my professional career, but one that I return to as I think about integrating my Christian faith with what I learn about mental health and relationships and family health. And I'm going to come back to this topic of integration um, as we go through the lecture. But I also want to share with you just some of how I played around with this topic for myself of the interplay between se the selfish of human beings, which would be a biblical worldview that would, could be called sin, and on the other side, our immaturity, our anxiety, or our undifferentiation. I don't think they are the same thing. Uh, I think they both come to community, and I've shown through the reciprocal arrows that I see that they feed into each other and are both important to take into account in understanding the human condition. So a little shift now from thinking about biblical lenses and family systems theory, I'm going to come back to considering this idea of sensitivities in community, what relationships under pressure look like. And I hope this gives you a sense of understanding the change in communities when stress is high. It's the same with a family. They are totally different organisms. The family, the church, the school, any community, a workplace, a team, when stress ramps up. And do you remember from lecture one, I talked about a 101 of understanding emotional well-being in terms of anxiety, fear gets activated, stress is the response to fear activation, it's a physiological response. And the problem is when it is sustained stress beyond the actual threat, which I think is a lot of the air we breathe, breathe in society at the moment, even pre-pandemic. So what happens in a family and tonight in a community or in a church when stress ramps up? And I think this illustrates it very helpfully that when there is an anxiety which is quite contagious, even young children can pick up tension. Even my puppy dog at home can pick up tension in their owners, we are finely tuned to picking up the cues of stress and tension in others. So when it's not there, you see in the top of this slide, there's an even balance between doing things together and doing things 
autonomously. And there is a little bit of immaturity that goes into the side that is fusion, the herding instinct, clumping together, needing to all think the same way, being afraid to disagree with people. That's the togetherness side. It's always present, but when stress is low, there's enough of a balance with maturity, goal direction, values, self-regulation, people who are able to think and act on behalf of themselves rather than in reaction to others. But you ramp up stress and look at that big red arrow there. Up goes the forces of togetherness in our communities and down goes, it gets overshadowed the forces of maturity. I think it's just worth being aware of it and not being derailed by it. And one of the things that it raises is the importance of managing the stress response in community and leaders managing that stress response. Because the most helpful thing one can do to nurture is bring a genuine sense of calm to a stressful situation. Not, not pretending, but making an effort to be thoughtful, to lower the tone of reactivity in one's voice, and this can bring a community back to a better balance of togetherness and separateness. Turning now to relationship patterns that interfere with nurture. I wondered as I was going to present this whether some of you are thinking, Jenny, you are just being very negative. You're talking about all the pitfalls, all the problems, all the things that interfere with, with, with nurture. And I considered that as I was reviewing this lecture this afternoon. But I would say that awareness of the pitfalls and the predictable patterns that us immature humans get caught up in. If we can be aware of that and make conscious adjustments to those patterns, I think that is the most useful gift to the flourishing of a group than just focusing on do this, this positive thing, this positive thing, uh, bring this technique of positivity into a community. I am wondering, and I'm inviting you to wonder with me, what is the impact of people being aware of these pitfalls that enables you to be consciously choosing to make some adjustments. So what we've got here, relationships that interfere with nurture, you've heard of a few of these already. I've talked a lot about the, the reciprocal circular process of over and under functioning. The distancing mechanism that I proposed the other night, and I've heard this from um, Bowen scholars at conferences, it is the universal mechanism for managing stress and relationships that humans have, but also there is the mechanism of over pursuing others to get them to change rather than working on self, that pursuing that we've talked about in some of the question time, and conflicts erupting. I'm introducing a new thought tonight, which is the problem of triangling. You can see in this quite humorous little cartoon diagram that the essence of a triangle is two people aligned and one person on the outside. This little circle, little stress ball, looks very upset being on the outside. Many people gravitate to the outside of intensity between others, so there are different dynamics to triangles. But I do want to briefly introduce you to the problem of triangles getting in the way of nurturing in community. When people align with another to try and fix or change the third person, and the problem of getting in the middle of disagreements, not being able to let people stay in contact to sort their tensions out is something that is a problem for flourishing communities. I've got uh, an animated slide now 
that can give you a picture of what can happen when stress gets into a church community and the predictable patterns that ensue from that. So we've got this tense emotional field, remembering that every member of the community carries heightened sensitivity and reactivity. And we have two people who are members of a church community or whatever community you're thinking of for your context tonight and they have a conflict together. There's the eruption of conflict, but they're in a community and people are reacting to the presence of that conflict. So there are people that step in quite quickly here. We've got someone that comes alongside person B and someone that comes alongside person A. And can you see the person up the top has that rescuing reaction you poor person dealing with this other person and sympathizing and aligning with them. And I would say that that would be Joe, the, the de-identified case I sp spoke about earlier. But it doesn't stop there. You see how it spreads in community. So what happens next? waiting for the next animation. We've got an, a person going to, let's say, the, the leader of the community, a senior pastor or a principal, saying that Joe up there, she's no good for him. And out of that, we get more. The principal or the senior pastor goes to Joe on his ministry team and says, you are not helping, you're enabling, you've got to stop doing that, we need to send this person off to help, you're going to get burnt out if you do it. Doesn't stop there. Then we have another person coming into Joe's defense saying, you're mean, I think I'm gonna leave this church tomorrow for the way you've treated Joe. And you can see how splits occur in community and it doesn't stop there. Then we've got Joe going to another member of the community saying, I am exhausted and depressed. And then the original person in the conflictual two-person relationship saying she deserves it. Oh, it's exhausting to think about, isn't it? But have you seen it happen before your very eyes? And you've come in in one part of the spread of triangles and you wonder what's the story behind it? And this is the problem with the spread of triangling that happens through complaining, detouring the problem away from the original two people. So the challenge is to keep, allow to tolerate tensions and difficulties and disagreements staying in the relationship in which they belong. And I'm sure I'll get questions about this. I'm not gonna to talk to it tonight, but there is a role for an objective third party who can help the tension be worked out between the original twosome. A quote that I, thought was worth putting up there, again from the book that I co-edited with this author, Lauren Arrington, who I might also say is my successor, a very capable successor as executive director of the Family Systems Institute. And she's written a chapter in the book on triangling and the dilemmas of being a ministry spouse in getting caught in triangles. And I think it's a useful quote to consider just how we see strife between others and how hasty we are to intervene and try and smooth things over. But the difficulty with triangling is that these interventions, while they're often welcomed by the people who are struggling, no one likes attention but are they necessary and are they helpful to creating nurturing communities? Mature non-anxious togetherness. 
I read a quote from a secular writer on Bowen theory, Dr. Michael Kerr again, who's written that propaganda is a prime example of triggering the togetherness force in a destructive way. Think about that, this kind of intense, preachy, anxious propaganda is a destructive expression of relationship togetherness. But Kerr writes about religions that they generally trigger the togetherness force in a constructive way, supporting principles and ideals that people generally consider important, but struggle to live by consistently. I think we can humbly agree with that. But I wanted to put that in to say that there is a place for positive togetherness forces and unity. Coming back to the Bible as a wisdom resource alongside secular theories for understanding human struggles, I have been very interested in the thoughtful writing of David Pallison, uh, who coming out of a, a counseling movement within the church. And Paulison writes about the church recovering its nurturing, not outsourcing too quickly, and that this is a biblical imperative. And he writes about how to draw thoughtfully from secular wisdom and sources without putting the Bible to one side but having it as a meta-wisdom source. And I really like this. It, it's a guide for me in my own critiquing and thinking about secular psychology and psychiatry. He writes, first read the Bible for the humanity portrayed, as well as for the divinity revealed, and above all for the interaction between the two, humanity and divinity. Though myriads of significant details about individuals, human, social groups are not contained within the Bible. Learning to think the way Jesus thinks will rightly align all that we learn from other sources. I think that's a very useful quote for those listening tonight who have a Christian faith and are also engaging with the literature and academic fields of um, science and other sources, and particularly tonight considering psychology. I write in the book Bowen Family Systems Theory and Christian Ministry a couple of chapters, and I do say from my own Christian worldview that the process of change is not just left to the domain of human effort. The Christian faith presents a very different view of change where God's activity imperative by his spirit comes into play and there is a supernatural dimension. And I invite people to consider, I, I like the idea as a Christian of a humble, responsible dependency on, on the scriptural wisdom and on um, God's activity, but being responsible in my own learning and thinking in the way I've been equipped to do. We're coming to the end of this trek with different vantage points. I'm coming back to the story of Jo who in her work, side by side with me, explored how she could shift away from an instinctive reaction to rescue, to being able to be present with struggling people in her church, to be curious about them, to be res respectful of their stories and their expertise about their own stories, and to notice how her distress response gets so easily activated. And Joe and the many people that I'm basing Joe's story on will always in this work look at the families they grew up in. 
how is it that I have such heightened sensitivity to distress, Joe would ask, and we would look at the impact of her parents' divorce, her living with her mother, her mother's struggles, she was an elder sibling, her responsibility to care for her mother, get caught in the middle of the triangles of tension between her mother and her father. And this was very helpful in her understanding her particular heightened sensitivities. In this next slide, you can see the quote from, uh, from the same chapter that I think is very similar to Joe's story written by Tara. She reflects on moving to being a nurturing side-by-side -side pastor, not a rescuing pastor, and identifies that she is as a result of applying these changes and this awareness, a lot less anxious in relating to fragile people, a lot clearer about what her role is. Because what happens with anxious relationships is we forget our roles, our purpose, our mission, and our vision. All of our energy gets sapped in the relationship dynamic. So I take note that Tara recognizes a recovery of her purpose and her role, her job description, if you like. And she now comes away from her encounters with all the many people on the continuum of maturity and vulnerability not feeling done in even feeling refreshed and encouraged. So promoting maturity, promoting nurture, perhaps they are the same thing, even though that was a slip of the tongue. Here is my summary as I've thought about pulling this together. First of all, attend to our own maturity gaps. Attend to our anxieties and our selfishness, do some plank removal, thinking of the Bible there from Matthew 7, before taking specks out of other people's eyes. Person to person, stay in contact, especially with the people we find difficult. If we just stay in contact with the people who affirm us and validate us, we are not helping communities flourish and become more nurturing. So tolerating tension, tolerating symptoms. They are part of the human condition in the anxious world we live in. Restrain from talking about others or on behalf of others. That's the triangling mechanism. Work at representing ourselves honestly, openly, speaking the truth in love, Ephesians 4. And this is a really big one. Bowen calls this speaking from the I position, not the you position. It's not an assertiveness training technique. It's much deeper than that. It's speaking from within self. Here's what I think. Here's what I will do. Here's how I'm affected by this situation. What about you? Person to person, speaking from the I, not at the self. So there is beauty to be found in community and cultivating human nurture. My aim in these three lectures has been to open up your curiosity, to open up some new conversations about our current mental health vulnerabilities and our treatment systems, in particular to ask what kind of help helps, what kind of help truly nurtures human growth in development and learning as opposed to inadvertently promoting helplessness or entitlement. I have presented a case each night for reducing, not eliminating, reducing and adjusting the kind of professional medical help that is mostly used for addressing mental health concerns with its focus on diagnosis and treatment. In reducing the medicalizing, might there be the opportunity to access more of the growth potential of all of us being ourselves in our real 
relationships, in our messy, real relationships, and recognizing the continuum that we're not all on the same even playing field and bringing grace to that. I personally am committed in my professional life at this stage, getting towards, I think, an, a, an end stage, however long that might be, um, God willing, of my professional life, I'm committed to doing what I can to foster the inclusion of family, parents in particular, in um, treatment of helping young people do better. That's um, the area I'm putting most of my energy into at this stage. I want to conclude now moving away from the professional domain with a personal consideration of the limits of human nurture. And this topic of thinking about nurture in faith community gives me permission. I think it's important that I do so. I personally see that the greatest act of nurture is an, a creator God who has compassion for his creation in our struggles, who comes down to us, who invites us not to try harder to fix ourselves, but to come as broken people. So I think in the topic of nurture confronting a crisis, my own belief is that there is a, a crisis that we need help with, a relationship crisis between our struggling human selfish road on this earth and a good and loving creator God. My own journey. In my early adult life, particularly in my 30s, as I was studying overseas, doing were a master's at Columbia University, mixing with a lot of intelligent people and striving for success and loving the success of that academic setting and the growing opportunities presented to me professionally. I can look back and see that I started to try and write my own script for my faith journey, not the one that I'd been trained in in my teenage years as part of a Christian church. I wanted a faith and spiritual journey that fitted me to my tribe better, that would be more acceptable. A spirituality where there would be a mixing pot of different religious philosophies. And I went on a genuine journey of exploring uh, some different pathways. I'm grateful for that journey. But as I did it, I kept reading some of the other literature on ethics, philosophy, atheism, Buddhism, other religions. And it kept ringing for me that the words that I knew from Jesus' teaching in the Bible had an incisiveness that I wasn't reading in these other texts. There was just something more to it. I found myself struck by the wisdom of Jesus' teaching, as recorded in the Gospels, where it says the people were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority, not as the secular teachers of the law. I think that left to my own devices, I would have gradually, gradually, rationalizing away, wandered away from my faith and my faith community. My religion would have become my personal, professional work projects, um, family systems theory would be my main guide for life and direction. And even the pursuit of differentiation of self might have become a bit of a religion for me and just gotten out of perspective. But I personally have no doubt that a real loving God, nurturing God, has reached into my self-referencing and pride and stubbornness and people-pleasing sensitivities, which you can hear come through in this story, and he has called me back to him. 
And I do ask listeners out there, I, not, I know not everyone is from a faith community, but I want to invite listeners to consider if they sense as they listen this same niggling feeling I had of a calling from something outside of myself, from the divine, a sense of something more. So let me finish with what are perhaps the greatest words of nurture that are on offer in the Christian faith community with all of its messiness and anxiety. Um, certainly I would put Jesus at the very, very top of that continuum in terms of how he lived his life. And these words, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Now we turn to a, a period of questions, and I can see they're flooding in already. I don't have my glasses on, so I can't actually read them for you, but we'll remedy that fairly quickly. And our first question this evening is as follows. Am I right to think that children begin pretty close to the lower end of Bowen's maturity continuum and normal development would see maturity growth? That's a very interesting question. Thank you for it. I think that differentiation of self, the capacity to develop more independence while remaining connected with others, does start in infancy and gradually with the appropriate developmental stages, moves towards more differentiation, but it isn't guaranteed. And it can be impinged upon with a lot of stress in a family. But I think it is correct to say that an infant is completely dependent and fused with their mother in the womb and the early weeks and months of life and then gradually differentiates. So interesting question. Thank you. Our second question, there's a little bit of background needed here, I think. In Matthew 18 in the Bible, Jesus talks about um, resolving conflict and he says the first thing to do is go and talk to the person and try and resolve it with yourself. And if you can't do that, then go and see other people. Um, I, that is a broad brushstroke. So the question is, how does Matthew 18, in dealing with sin in the church, fit in with what you're suggesting? Pointing out sin in the offending person in private. If they don't listen, take others to establish as witnesses. Well, that deserves um, a, a talk all of its own. Um, I would just comment to say, isn't it interesting that the wisdom in that biblical context is start where it belongs? And I think in community, we're often reticent to do that and the triangling starts straight away. I do think that there shouldn't be a kind of harmony force that just glosses over people behaving irresponsibly and not being called to account but to do that maturely, openly, not behind people's backs. So I, I think there can be a consistency to that teaching and what I'm talking about in not jumping into triangles. Thank you. Do you have any tips on how we can recognize our own maturity gaps? It isn't something you can do from one night's lecture, reading a book, even though I talk a lot about it in growing yourself up, how to bring your best to relationships, recognizing maturity gaps and give examples from my own life of learning to recognize it. I, I think for people that take this seriously, 
it's a long-term effort and a complex effort and one that it's helpful to have a coach who's already traveled along that way or a mentor assist with. It's something that I have certainly valued and needed and still receive in my own journey to attend to my maturity gaps. Hmm. Interesting comment, thank you. Is there something called a local church culture? If so, how, one, how could one bring about cultural change to become an embracing and healing community? These questions are asking um, for another whole lecture. So I, it, it's a great question. I'm glad you're asking it, whoever's put that one forward and reflecting on it and talking with uh, others in your community about it. I, I do think that tribalism creates anxious cultures of churches in community and in denominations. People are reactive and fearful of criticisms that come from outside and we've got all sorts of um, stress-driven anxieties that can create a non-nurturing culture. And as I said tonight, I think um, one or two people who are prepared to work on themselves in bringing um, humility, grace, and a, an awareness of their own gaps can be a real gift to the beginnings of changing an anxious, reactive culture to a more nurturing culture, but with patience takes time and I think that, and Bowen said this, that leadership can come from anywhere in a family. It's not necessarily formal leadership, but having formal leadership can help with cultural change. Referring back to last night's talk, I'm wondering whether you've heard of the rising idea of gentle parenting, which is being put forward on a lot of social media and if so, whether it aligns with your idea of parenting. Thank you. Every night I get a question about a method or a model that I have never heard of. And it's amazing, isn't it? There's so much out there now in social media. How can we keep up? So I can't comment on it, but uh, you've got me curious. I'll have a look. Thank you. You suggest staying in contact with people we find difficult. Is there ever a place for cutting off contact? Mm -hmm. Another very thoughtful question. Um, it's very important not to hear these ideas as rules. They are principles and ideas that come from study of human behavior in family and in groups and they must be contextualized and everyone's situation is unique so of course there will be contexts where for safety's sake cut off is a good option um, and sometimes a period of distance and cutting off contact can be for a season for a person who's really lost themselves in that relationship to recover self. But here's the problem of cut off. I'll say this very briefly again, just to get you thinking and hopefully wanting to read more. But when we cut off, particularly from the previous generation, cut off from our parents, labeling them as difficult and causing us all sorts of problems. We replace our cutoff with an intense togetherness with a new partner or a new group. And out of that intense togetherness come symptoms because of the fusion. So these patterns can just get replicated from cutoff to getting lost in fusion, to cutting off again, and you see that in serial relationships. So I'll just throw that one in for extra food for thought on the excellent question about cutoffs. Thank you. 
How many people are in a normal social network? And therefore, how many could we expect someone to pastorally care for? I like this one. It's a good question, isn't it? And it fits with the piece of the lecture on thinking about the scope of relationships that anyone can deal with before burning out, which is a legitimate question for anyone dealing with community. I don't have an answer. I think it's a, a specific number, what is the scope? And certainly we do all have different temperaments. That is something that Kagan and the, his Harvard University colleagues have made very clear that temperament is a real genetic thing in terms of extroversion and introversion, so our scope for dealing with different relationships is quite very, that will also sit on a continuum. But I think it's problematic to try, and for leaders in particular, to try to have meaningful contact with too many people rather than being very thoughtful about who are the people who I am most responsible for staying in good contact with, for the health of this community and not um, skipping over direct reports or members of the team and not trying to be all things to all people. But it's an excellent question for discussion. Especially in a college context. Mm -hmm. Could you expand on the role of the third objective person in diffusing potential triangle problems, please? I predicted that question. Thank you for it. Um, when people are in a conflict, they are always, this is another predictable pattern, always hoping and inviting the third party to take their side <laughs> and put a lot of energy into con debating and convincing you of their view and the other person's wrong. So. The value of a neutral third party who doesn't get caught up in the content of debates but is able to tune in to the process of how the two people in conflict have been addressing their conflicts and what's been the effect of the manner in which they're dealing with their complaints and is that working, is that helping them to see why they're so stuck right now. And this is the essence of a family systems approach to counselling and therapy is not getting caught in people's complaints, not trying to just have techniques for helping you communicate better and get along, but helping each party in the tense situation, whether it's a couple in a marriage or two members of a congregation or a ministry team or a leadership team at a school, of in helping people to see that the way they're approaching the tension can reveal to them some ideas for doing better. Or well, two collegians living together in a group. How do we keep caring for and nurturing people who become invisible, the non-gregarious ones, who keep themselves to themselves, possibly because of mental conditions like chronic fatigue, AS, AS, ASD, mm -hmm. or depression, and thus do not make friends within the community? Well, I hope that you've heard the idea of accepting that people are on different levels of a continuum. They have different capacities to be in contact with others. And if they're in a community where people don't make a project out of changing them and declaring that they should be more gregarious, I would propose that that's the kind of community that opens up breathing space for vulnerable, shy, people for whatever reason to start to take risks and connect more, for people to be present with them but not pursue them. Thank you. That's food for thought for me. Thank you. If I want to grow in my emotional maturity, what is a good first step to take? The trap of question time is you're inviting me to sound like I have all the answers or kid myself that I do, that there is some 
straightforward answer to these questions, and they're all complex questions, and people will work out their own best way to tackle this. I would invite you to consider some of the things you've heard tonight or read in a book about emotional maturity in the context of relationships and the emotional circuitry of relationships and just choose one thing that really made sense and start observing it and learning about it and be a researcher. Not rush to have a fast track of growth in maturity. Sadly, I don't think that is possible, at least from my experience in my own life. But to start to pick one thing that you can recognize going on in your own life and become a better observer of self with that. I hope I've got this question right. As a pastoral carer of a four-member team in a church, what can be done if few hurting people are seeking emotional support? So I, sense, I guess the sense is that there are people who are actually hurting. They're working together in a team, but they're actually just living with their hurt and not seeking assistance. That's my understanding of the question, Jenny. Mm -hmm. I would need to understand more of the context and ask more questions to be able to say much about that. Uh, but I just wonder what it is telling the team about the, the, the relationship system of the congregation that people are closed off from sharing their struggles? What are their fears? Are there anxieties? Are there um, inadvertently expectations of wellness and health for good Christians, whatever that is, and people are anxious and fearful about being real and vulnerable? I'm not sure, but that's where my mind went thinking about that question. Thank you. As we work on differentiation of self, how do we avoid becoming overly self-focused or selfish? With difficulty, it doesn't matter what project we take on that might start off as something um, very helpful and in service of others, it can be hijacked by self-interest every day whatever the project is. And I think that's something to be mindful of, humble about, and um, thoughtful about. But I think that working on dealing with our own maturity gaps to improve our capacity to be in calm and meaningful connection with others and also maintain our goal direction and our responsibilities as individual. That's the work of differentiation. That if you truly work on that, the balance of connection and separateness, it, it can be one of the best ways of caring for and serving other people. And um, being a resource to other people. But I want to also keep the caveat in there that self-referencing is part of the human condition. And Bowen, who wasn't, as I understand, a churchgoer, he did have a quote saying, there's a, a, a good bit of narcissism in all of us fighting for our own patch of real estate and self-interest. And I think we can observe that in ourselves and others and need to be mindful of it and humble about it. And as those of us in the Christian faith to be repentant of it and for everybody in community to be willing to be, um, to acknowledge the effect of self-referencing on, on the people around them, be willing to apologize. Covered a lot of territory. We've covered a lot of questions. I have a sense that we might be on our three last questions. Is that okay? That's very good. <laughs> <laughs> Is personality real and fixed, or only different ways to describe different points on our maturity continuum? I don't. 
need Bowen theory for this one. If you look at any of the literature from social psychology, it is very clear that social context means that personality can look very different across different spectrums and it is not fixed. And I wonder if you can also recognize that in your own life, that the context of the relationship and the culture of the system impacts how you express personality. At the same time, I've already talked about temperament as being clearly genetic, um, and that the inhibited temperament does influence expressions of personality, and that's where we get into the nature and nurture combination, which is a rich and important area, but I won't begin on that one tonight. Perhaps it now is not the time. Thank you, Dr. Brown. You've helped me to start looking at a log in my own eye since last night's lecture. Do you think a, a friendship where there is a high level of trust and openness could be a setting for mutually identifying maturity gaps. Do you want me to repeat that question? No, I've got, I think I've got that question. So I think it's asking about can we be in a trusting relationship and use the feedback of that relationship of people that observe us and see us of giving us feedback. It's hard to have that feedback and sometimes it's not that helpful because it's quite subjective from the other person who has their own sensitivities in the relationship. So I'm not quite sure how to answer that good question. I think that feedback can be useful if we invite it in a humble way, which the questioner is putting out there, of um, I asking someone who we know cares about us in a safe situation, to describe sensitivities that they notice in us. But I do think that there's a lot we can do by looking at our interactions with people, looking back to our family of origin and our patterns there to begin the process and probably then taking our hypotheses about our maturity gaps to a trusted other and asking if they see that in us might be a healthier way to go. I think this last question is sort of related. It sounds like for this to be effective and helpful, all parties involved need to understand their responsibilities and differentiation of self. How do we respond when this isn't the case? I wonder how it sounds like that, that everyone needs to get on board with this. It's not possible. We cannot expect everybody to be on the same page of accepting responsibility and we can't enforce that on others. It takes one or two people to work on themselves and lift themselves up. And I hear some people in counselling say, well, that isn't fair. I'm doing all the work in my family or in my community for growing my maturity. And the reality <laughs> is we often have a laugh together that other members of their family are getting all the benefits of lifting up the maturity of the whole system through their hard work without them being changed. They get the benefit because of the ripple effects of a calm, more mature person in a system. So it doesn't, it can happen from starting with one person in a system and it, um, I, it, that's the good news of thinking systems. Good. Thank you very much. I'll let you stand down for just a moment and I'll invite you back up in a second. Dr. Brown, we sincerely thank you for being willing to share with us over the last, these past three nights from the great wealth of wisdom that you've established by your clinical, professional and academic work over several decades. It's been a vast journey over demanding terrain, but on behalf of all of your listeners, I wish to thank you for your guidance, your unerring navigation and your knowledge of the best vantage points to appreciate the landscape before us. 
As I've been saying over the past three nights, addressing questions of nurture and mental health are the most important questions, I think, for this emerging generation. A few years ago, when I raised the question of mental health within the university context, one of my senior colleagues said, Bill, this will consume as much resources as you throw at it. I'm pleased to report that at least in my experience here within our colleges, that's not been the case. I have found that the young people living here in college are passionate about caring after, looking after each other well. Equally, sometimes, often, they're frustrated, even angry, with people of my age who are dismissive of their personal struggles. Our colleges are going to take much away from these lectures. Specifically, you've given us a roadmap, I believe, on how to engage with a difficult issue of mental health from the individual to the community scale. You've emphasised the importance of professional help. There's no denying of that. You've also emphasised to us the immense value of, of safe personal space. So that's something I've taken away from it. But I think uh, another key idea, without repeating your entire lecture series, is that there's a vision for each of us, no matter who we are, where we've come from, or what specific difficulties may afflict us personally, we can actually seek and develop appropriate support from those around us. As we continue, if we continue as we, as we have done in Australia, we've been, we will be overwhelmed, just as my academic colleague had recognised and said to me. You noted last night that appropriate policy frameworks seem to be just emerging that recognise the importance of family and community support for each of us in our struggles. I also want to finish by noting the great beauty of what you've shared with us. The fundamental value of each of us, no matter who we are, as I say, where we've come from or what specific difficulties we might be facing, and also the fundamental value of relationship as a key means of providing strength and support for us all. I mean, these are fundamentally Christian views, belief that each and every person is valuable and precious in their own right because of the value bestowed on them by God himself. I shared privately with you of my time with a group of people suffering from severe mental ill health and the joy of hearing them talk of the steadfastness and the love of God. There is hope in the midst of personal chaos. As you said tonight, God seeks a peaceful relationship for each of us through Jesus. And likewise, peaceful relationships between each of us. There can be peace in the midst of personal chaos. I'm tempted to go on, but I've said enough. It's, over, it's now over to us um, to thank Jenny for her hard work on our behalf and for making such complex issues clear and accessible the lecture recordings will assist us to assimilate the breadth and depth of the material that we've covered. So on behalf of us all, I thank you. Now, uh, we actually finished with a presentation to our lecturer. And so there's a very special presentation. And I think Adela is going to retrieve the items from behind the curtain for me, rather than me getting down, if that's OK. Um, so uh, if people listening are interested in the history of the new college lectures, that's available on our website. And there's also a very fine history of our colleges, which you can also order from our website. You'll find a list of major international authors and publications that have emerged from new college, uh, new college lectures over 35 years from previous generations of trustees. That's fantastic. Thank you. And so. Tonight, we wish to thank our lecturer, and I'll invite her back on, up on stage. And under normal circumstances, I would shake her hand, but in honour of Captain COVID, I'm not going to do that. I am simply going to show people what this very handsome medal looks like. I will bow to her in traditional <laughs> Asian fashion and delicately pass wow. the medal to thank her. You. Thank you very much. So, thank you. And equally, please don't go for a moment. Um, we have some flowers for our lecturer as well. So um, Adela, I think, will present those to you. And you can do that now. And if they're extremely heavy, you could just you can pop them up there if you're finding it a bit too much. Lovely.
Thank you. And look, in here I've just got a couple of little things. There's one thing missing which uh, in times of COVID I found getting gifts for people, they get damaged in transit. So there's one gift that's still on its way. Now, some, one thing I should note as I finish is that there's often a long, a long suffering person in the background. I believe his name is David. Um, and so in here, there's, there's a little gift for you and a little gift for David. And there's another gift for David coming as well, but I'll send that through to you in, in due course. So look, uh, thank you. Uh, well, I don't know whether David's listening out there. Would he be listening, do you think? But anyway, he please, please to extend to him our appreciation for his <laughs> generosity as well. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you. For those that remain, sincere thanks for joining us uh, tonight and this week. We sincerely hope that these lectures bring blessing to you personally as well, equipping, as well as equipping and inspiring you to be a good influence in our society. As I finish, I just want to remind you that we make these lectures available as a, gift, as a free service to Australian society. We're not for profit here at New College and New College Postgraduate Village. If you appreciate our work, uh, we would appreciate support for our scholarships program and the details of this are available on our website. Equally, you may know someone who wants to come to the University of New South Wales. I would say there's no better university to come to um, and they may benefit from living with us. So if you quote the new college tag, NCL 2021, to our admissions officer, we will waive the admission fee for coming to our colleges. And of course, we also publish a journal and a summary of the lectures will appear in the next edition. It's called Case Quarterly and it does attract leading thinkers from around the globe. We do have special prices on subscription and if you just Google Case Quarterly, you can find it, find us and we'll offer that special subscription price to you. Sadly, we've reached the end, but to all of those of you that are listening in, we do look forward to welcoming you back. We will be in touch as we plan the next phase of our journey with the new college lectures in 2022. Thank you and good night. <laughs>